Hi, I'm Katya. And I'm Rin. And we're here at the Commonwealth Center for Holistic Herbalism in Boston, Massachusetts. And on the internet everywhere, thanks to the power of the podcast. Woo! And maybe YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> we're trying something a little different this time. Uh, we're going to see if we can make these podcasts onto the YouTubes also. Yeah, we'll so you can listen with your ears or your eyes or both. Yeah. Whatever you like. Check it out. Yeah. Uh, but if you're listening, then you found it, so you're good to go. <laughs> uh, so this week's topic, we're going to talk about herbs for going through a Whole30, also known as herbs to help you survive a Whole30, <laughs> and herbs to help your loved ones survive you going through your Whole30. Uh, it's best if you and your loved ones go through a Whole30 at the same time. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But that's not always on the menu. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And the thing is that this, so a Whole30 is just one kind of a sort of cross between a like diet detox. Mm -hmm. um, I use big quotey marks around that. Reset is like a big I, word I like that word kind of a little better. Mm -hmm. um, and also it's an, it's an elimination diet that's really helpful if somebody's trying to figure out their food allergies. But even if you're not concerned about food allergies, a uh, Whole30 is a chance to get all of the sugar out of your diet for one month to get all of the most common inflammatory foods out of your diet for a whole month. It's not saying these foods are good or bad. It's not saying that you're bad if you like them. Mm. It's just saying, hey, let's take a month and cut down on inflammation, basically. Right. So the things that... Oh, I'm really on a roll here, and we haven't given our reclaimer yet. You are on a roll. Yeah, let's do yeah. that. Yeah, so like every week, we just want to remind you that we are not doctors, we are herbalists and holistic health educators. The ideas discussed in this podcast do not constitute medical advice. No state or federal authority licenses herbalists in the United States, so these discussions are for educational purposes only. Everybody's body is different, so the things that we're talking about may or may not apply directly to you, but we hope that they'll give you some good information to think about and research more. That's right, and we just want to remind you that good health is your own personal responsibility. The final decision when you're considering any course of therapy, whether it's discussed on the internet or <laughs> prescribed by a physician, is always yours. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, so, um, you know, changing your diet can be a lot. Uh, yeah. There can be a lot to it, and uh, for a lot of people, doing a Whole30 can be a really big change to the diet. Yeah, um, yeah. <clears throat> you know, some folks come straight from your your standard American diet with its acronym SAD and its, <laughs> and its uh, nutrient quality, pretty sad too. Um, yeah. and, and jump right into a Whole30 because they're ready for a change. And I think that's awesome. I, you know, I really respect that kind of drive and initiative. And, you know, it's New Year's, so some of that kind of feeling is going around. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's not always very easy. And so there are things that can help you to get through it. Yeah. I wanted to just um, sort of, you know, you can find all, out all about the Whole30 at Whole30.com. Um, but, uh, and we're not like affiliated with them in any way, but it's just a really um, helpful tool for people who are trying to figure out if food is playing a role in their health issues um, or people who are really interested in um, detox type stuff. Um, it's just a very, very helpful and well thought out tool. So the key factors here is to, is to eliminate for 30 days, all grains, all dairy products, not eggs, but any, any kind of milk from an animal or milk products from an animal, um, all sugar. And that doesn't mean fruit, but it does mean any kind of added sugar, all legumes mm -hmm. and yes. alcohol. Right. And the reason that those five things were chosen is because those are the most common, like big inflammatory promoting right. foods. Yeah, and then and one other one other key thing there is that in the course of um, avoiding things like soy and corn, so mm -hmm. your grains and your legumes and so on, you're also avoiding their oils. So that's going to okay. be soy oil and corn and canola oil and cottonseed oil. And all of those things are also going to be on the avoid list for this period. Again, because they are so pro-inflammatory, they right. really wreak inflammatory havoc in the body. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's the idea. And the other part of the idea there is you're going to do that for 30 days. And you're going to stick to it uh, like you like you mean it. Like, like you mean it. Like your life depends on it. Yeah. Uh, like your, your brand new and improved life depends on it. Yeah, like you're a committed <laughs> person who has the power to stick to something. That's what. Yeah. That's what you're like. Yeah. yeah. 
You are that, in fact. <laughs> um, yeah, so you do that, and uh, then, after the end of 30 days, uh, you drop everything and go immediately back to the way you were eating before, right? No. No, not exactly. <laughs> this is one of the other things that we really like about this program, and whether you follow it to a T, or whether you take pieces of it uh, and experiment, um, you know, or you have another version that's kind of similar, uh, but has its own set of rules or regulations or whatever, these ideas are really helpful when they have a finish line. And uh, they're helpful for everybody. They're helpful for you know the person going through it, um, and for also for us as practitioners when we're advising right. people with these kinds of things. Um, because having the finish line, having the idea of you're going to do this thing, you're going to stick with it, you're going to do it, but with this time frame, and so you know when to start and when to finish, uh, and then you know that things may change a bit uh, by the time you get to the end. Well, and it's those changes that we're really working on exploring and and honestly that's true for any kind of holistic health therapy or any kind of holistic like we can really call all of them experiments yeah um yeah. because everything is about figuring out what works best for your body everybody's body is different and so for me ginger and chamomile is like the power team that if i don't know what to do it will probably improve my situation but for somebody else, there may be some other, like, perfect, best thing. And, and you do, you need to, whatever it is, you need to do a little experimentation. Even something, I, I was going to say silly or dumb, I was going to kind of diminish it, but it's not yeah. to be diminished at all. Right. Even something like movement, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, you, yeah. it takes a little bit of experimentation to find the movement style that works for you, that you enjoy, that you can stick with, that feels good in your body and doesn't cause injury or pain. Life is about experimenting. Yeah, and you know, framing it as experimentation, whether it's movement or a diet change or whatever other intervention you're making, that also helps you from feeling like, I've tried the thing, I didn't enjoy the thing, I couldn't sustain the thing, and now I guess that thing's not for me. Or so it didn't work, so right. nothing will work. Yeah, so if it's movement, it's like, I went to the gym, and I got on the, on the Nautilus, and I you know, took the Zumba class and I just didn't really enjoy it. And I didn't feel better afterwards either. So maybe fitness isn't a thing that I can have in my life. Yeah. I, I don't know how else you're supposed to get strong or get healthy or whatever. Right. So people can feel limited by, by that. Um, and framing it as an experiment, I'm going to try this and see if I enjoy it. I'm going to try this particular kind of movement. I'm going to try this particular dietary overhaul, see what happens. Uh, that's super helpful. Yeah. So that's a big part of it. The other part there, though, is that um, when you reach the end of your Whole30, you're going to reintroduce things and you're going to do it in a structured way. So you're not going to um, have eliminated gluten and dairy and soy and corn and seed oils and all of that, and then come back and have a little bit of everything. All on the first day. All on day one. You're going to uh, plan it out a bit and say, all right, well, I'm going to try reintroducing uh, you know, dairy, or even maybe I'm going to try reintroducing fermented dairy only. Mm -hmm. for the first week and see how that goes. See how it feels in Try your body. Try out a couple different versions of dairy over the course of a month and see which ones are good and which ones give me trouble. So, you know, there's many, many, um, uh, like, l levels of intricacy that you could involve yourself in with that. But the overall, the overall um, point is that you can get clearer data that way. Yeah, and that's really, for me, that's really the key because... As a practicing herbalist, as a clinical herbalist, I, I am always talking to people about food because it plays such a huge role in our everyday health. And um, so for a long time, I would listen to what people s said and, and were describing and how their body felt. And then I would say, you know, it really sounds to me like you could have a gluten sensitivity or you could have a dairy sensitivity. And so based on my assessment, then a client would try something and there still was that experimentation and feeling like, well, I'll try it and I'll see how that feels in my body and that's good. Yeah. But I like this even better because I always am looking to put the power in the hands of the client. Um, and so this is an experiment where I am not the one saying you need to give up gluten if you ever want to get better. They are the one experiencing it in their own body just so that we can all agree, hey, I think there's a food issue here. And I can even talk about all the reasons in an educational way why I think this or that food might be involved in the issue. Um, but I, 
I, the power is still in the hands of the client to say, great, I'm going to try this. And then it, my experiment is going to tell me whether or not your hypothesis is accurate. Right. I am going to know by how my body feels if I am the one motivated to make these changes in a more long-term kind of way. Yeah. Cool. All right. So um, it's a plan and we like it. Uh, <laughs> and then, um, you know, this, this particular podcast today was going to be about how to make it easier. So first thing I would say is there's a, a super handy um, article from the Whole30 people um, called The Timeline. And uh, The Timeline is basically from seeing a lot of people go through this. <laughs> uh, sorry, Lucy Cat is uh, brushing up against the mic. So yeah, she's, she's really interested in the microphone. <laughs> there's weird furry sounds coming through, then that's why. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, the sound of fur against the microphone. Okay, anyway. Yes. <laughs> the, the timeline. There we go. All right, the timeline. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So this is like a, a description of, here's what usually happens when people do this, right? And it's like, okay, so day one is like, yeah, whatever, no big deal. I'm so committed. This is going to be great. And then uh, the next couple days are the hangover. And then you've got the kill all the things days. And then you have the days where you just want to nap. And days when you feel a little bloated and days when you're feeling like you're slogging through, and then suddenly you're feeling pretty energetic and you're feeling pretty good, but maybe you're also kind of bored with the food because you've eaten so many eggs and you're sick of it. <laughs> uh, you yeah. know, and then after a while you um, feel like, okay, I'm, I'm, am I done yet? Am I done? Am I done? Yeah. And then you also realize, wait a minute, I'm almost done. <laughs> <laughs> What's going to happen then? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, if you haven't already, if you're doing a Whole30, you're thinking about it, I really advise reading that article because that can that can really help you to set your expectations, um, not just for bad things, right? right? Also for like, wait, how long is it going to be before I feel great? Yeah. Um, that's super important, and, and it's a, that's relevant for all kinds of things. I mean, as herbalists, that's relevant when I give somebody a, a tea blend or a tincture. Yeah. Uh, how long sh should it be before you notice a change is something I always try to tell them, remind myself to think about, because that can really make or break someone's experience right. with an experiment like that. I think also it's really helpful emotionally and motivationally to know that although your experience might not be exactly the same as their timeline, um, that the things that you are experiencing are, are not weird. Like, yeah, right. like the day that you wake up and you're like, everybody get out of my way. I am going to kill something today. <laughs> You don't have to be like, what is wrong with me? Why am I a terrible person? Am I broken? Does this mean that this way of eating is actually bad for me? <laughs> yeah. 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 But instead you can recognize, oh, okay, there are hormonal changes happening in my body and I'm just sort of having a little PMS moment, except it isn't PMS. It's like some <laughs> other hormonal shift right. and, and that is affecting my mood and yeah. that's okay. And I, and I mean, this is all based on predictable changes in, in your internal chemistry and your internal like energy uh, manufacturing, yeah. uh, power, you know, like <laughs> you, for most, for most people going through this process, you are shifting, um, some of the macronutrient profile of your diet, uh, to have fewer carbs overall and especially fewer refined carbs mm -hmm. and to have, uh, a little more fat, maybe a bit more protein than you had been previously. Um, but also a lot more, uh, plant nutrients and plant complexity, especially the way we do it. Right. Right. <laughs> Where right, it's right. going to be like, you know, it's great to get some more bitter greens in your life. And that's a, a place to introduce your herbs. And anyway. Yeah. Yeah. All those things. Okay. But so herbs. Yeah. Um, oh, oh, there's an addition to the list. Yeah. Here it comes. It's going to get there. <laughs> okay. So um, the first category of herbs that I really want to talk about. Um, and I think that this also really... Um, displays my own like areas of trouble. We do whole thirties a few times a year, um, partially because if we're going to recommend it to clients, we feel like we should do it as well. Even though we always are very strictly gluten free and dairy free, um, and a few other things, uh, you know, sugar creeps in. And so every, uh, every, Few months. It's kind of the common denominator for, yeah. for <laughs> yeah, sugar. Uh, modern diets. Is, sugar creeps yeah. in. Yeah, um, and so you can really see here like the, where I struggle with the two herbs that I want to bring up very first. And that these are two herbs that really help with cravings. Mm. 
So if you're a long time listener of the pod, you may have in mind which two of these are going to be. Uh, are you ready for the big reveal? It is Skizandra and Tulsi. Yeah. Um, Skizandra, well, let me start with Tulsi, actually. Tulsi is an herb that is well renowned for helping to um, uh, stave off cravings, helping to sort of change our relationship with cravings, helping to um, just allow a, a sort of break between our mood and our need for a certain type of donut um, or whatever. Um, and a lot of times when you are trying to give something up is like to give up sugar or to give up something that you really enjoy for a while, it can, you can really get bogged down in, in those feelings of deprivation and Tulsi just is amazing in helping to, to lift you up out of that bogged down place and to help you to really free yourself from needing that cake or whatever in order to feel satisfied, content, like you're going to make it through your day, whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's really pretty fantastic. Now, this effect of Tulsi is probably not something you're going to observe if you, um, you know, buy yourself a bottle of Tulsi tincture and take a squirt. Yeah. Or, or if you buy some Tulsi capsule supplements and take two of them in the morning. Um, this effect is going to be most notable when you have extended, uh, consistent work with Tulsi over a period of time. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about some easy ways to get Tulsi into your life. You know, Tulsi tastes good. You can drink it as tea and I... I am doing that right now, actually. Yeah, um, we have some I, in our mix today. Yeah, I definitely recommend it. It blends well with other plants, but it, it's also, it's great completely on its own. Um, so I personally feel like that's one of the easiest ways to do it. There, um, there are some Tulsi tea bags. Uh, Organic India is one brand that is medicinally potent, and the other would be traditional medicinals. Yeah, both kind of handy if you're if you're you know in the, in a shop and just want to grab something quick, or if you're away from home or something. Right. In it, like visiting a different city, you know, you can go over there and find like, oh look, it's Tulsi with rose, Tulsi with chamomile, Tulsi with mint. This is awesome. And especially if you're kind of maybe just starting out with herbs and you don't just have a big shelf with all these jars filled with whatever and Tulsi. Yeah. Um, like it is okay. Make sure that you're getting tea bags that are medicinally potent, and those are two brands that I that I rely on for that. Um, not not just any old tea bag, but those two really in particular, um, you can depend on to be medicinally active, and and especially because maybe at work you don't have a lot of leeway for anything super out of the ordinary, but you can manage to put a tea bag in a cup and go get the hot water and put it in, and totally. because of that, it would allow you to drink three or four cups during the day. That would be fantastic. Um, another really sort of easy to add to your life way to get Tulsi in is to make a, like a quart of Tulsi tea. Um, and you can make it overnight. Tulsi doesn't have to sit overnight, like nettle, for example, but it's okay to let it sit overnight. As long as you keep it covered. As long as you keep it covered. Completely covered, yeah. Alternately, when you wake up in the morning, you can um, go ahead and make up your Tulsi tea kind of first thing, and then have your shower, get dressed, do all the stuff, and now it's been like 30 minutes or whatever, and then pour it into your thermos. That 30 minutes is long enough for Tulsi to sit. Um, even 20 minutes is fine. And pour it into your thermos, and you can make a whole quart that way and then take it with you um, and drink it all day long. That's another way to, to do it, and it's pretty quick. You yeah, know? yeah, for sure. Um, you can work with Tulsi as a tincture as well, whether you make your own or, or buy one from a, from a maker that you trust or has good quality. Um, it's a fine way to take this herb. Um, we have infused Tulsi into honey sometimes. Oh, yeah. You can, you can grow a fresh plant. Um, it has a pretty broad range of climates that it will, that it will grow happily in. You know, we're up here in New England, um, and there are some varieties that grow pretty well around here. Uh, of course, the plant is, uh, you know, native to... Um, to India, most famously, yeah. <laughs> um, but other other places as well. So, uh, yeah, it's a really fantastic herb. And if you ever do have fresh plant, then 
that's definitely one I'd advise to like nibble on a leaf every now and again. Yes. Um, do some of those honey infusions or fresh plant tincture that really captures those aromatic complexities of it really well. Yeah. But uh, yeah, fantastic herb. Uh, one more thing I wanted to mention about Tulsi is that it does have a really beneficial effect on the endocrine system as well, in particularly in your body's ability to process sugar and carbohydrates and sort of uh, that is an area where, especially if you are feeling like, oh, I have really been eating a lot of sugar lately, um, you may have some impairment in that. Right. And, and so Tulsi can help rebuild that in a healthy way. In healthy, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm saying relationship. That's not what I'm trying to say, <laughs> but like a healthy mechanism of pro doing that processing work. Right, and that's a large part of why Tulsi is helping with the with the sugar cravings that you may experience during your whole thirty, um, but also with cravings for things like bread or gluten sources that that you um, had been having super consistently. If that's mm. if that's just changed for you. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, one of the things that happens when you go on the Whole30 in particular, um, which is a bit different from other ways of uh, eliminating gluten from your diet, is that you're also eliminating all the other grains at the same time. Yeah. And so this is um, one, of the, one of the rules, actually, is that you're not going to be looking for gluten-free substitutes or dairy-free right. substitutes. And so... This is not about your gluten-free bagels. Right. And so that's, that's probably one of the reasons why doing this rather than a straight-up gluten elimination... Uh, does tend to drastically reduce people's intake of carbs and sugars and so on. Um, and so you are uh, really asking your body to switch its fuel uh, processing from primary reliance on rapidly digested carbohydrate to relying instead on slower digested carbs and on proteins and on fats and mm. utilizing the full range of possible substrates for cellular right. energy. And it is not a zero carb situation. No way. It's just that you're, you're switching to sweet potatoes and beets and apples and rutabaga and even white potatoes, like whatever as right. your carb sources instead. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing that we often do find is necessary to emphasize with people or, or even ourselves sometimes. <laughs> I'd be like, all right, we're doing Whole30, but we're not, we're not trying right now, unless you are, <laughs> right, to, right, to drastically reduce carb content. Um, for some people who have maybe like they don't have any weight to lose right then we have to be saying all right you can change your diet like this but you got to watch out because if you're not actually thinking about it planning for it then you might suddenly be um like drastically reducing your calorie intake too yeah um and so yeah sweet potatoes and beets and root veggies and it's fruits like and more stuff. more nutritionally dense carbohydrates they are yeah. instead of empty carbohydrates because even rice it, you know, like whole rice that isn't super processed, it still is not nutritionally it's, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's 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 definitely calories and it's way better than like ground up whatever. But a sweet potato has more to offer than just plain rice. You know, so we're we're trying to switch over to those nutritionally dense carbohydrates. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Uh, and Tulsi can help. Yes, and Tulsi <laughs> can that help. all the way back around. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right, awesome. Well, so then the next one um, in regards to cravings is schizandra. Oh my goodness. Schizandra, yeah. So this is a berry. Um, it's a very interesting berry because um, it's not just sweet and it's not just a hint of sour, <laughs> like lots of berries are. Yeah. Um, it is like powerfully sour and also a bit sweet. And wait, is that bitter I taste? Is there pungency happening? What is going on here? Yeah. Um, schizandra, schizandra, oh, there it is. Um, schizandra berries, uh, in, in the Chinese name, um, it, it's like five flavor berry. Yeah. Um, and they are, they are super powerful. They are, um, a taste experience to be sure. Yeah. They're kind of like herbal pop rocks. Um, and I was just going to put some in my mouth right now, but, but the thing is that they do make you really salivate, and if I do that right now, then it's going to be hard to talk. Uh, so I think actually I won't. But um, but right off the bat, if you're a person who struggles with dry mouth, you're going to love schizandra, let me tell you. Yeah. Um, so schizandra, there is, it, this is a, an herb that is comes to us from the Chinese medicine tradition, but it does grow in the U.S. And in fact, in central Massachusetts, there is a big schizandra farm, which is really cool. 
Um, and Catalyst Kombucha Company makes Schizandra Kombucha, and it's just, it's pretty awesome. Um, so I have heard, and I am, you know, I don't speak Chinese, I do not practice Chinese medicine, but I was told that a traditional way to work with Schizandra is to take 10 berries every day for 100 days. Now I can't, I don't know for certain if that's accurate. Maybe, maybe some of you have a Chinese medicine background and can let me know. But I was intrigued by that, and even if it isn't accurate, I do think that it's very cool because... Um, I mean, empirically it works. <laughs> because empirically it works. Not to give away the game. Yeah, <laughs> the foreshadowing. End of your story, but yeah. Uh, empirically it works, but also I love that baked into the recommendation is the amount of time that it's going to take to really settle in. And I like 100 days. That's like... That's a season. Hmm. And that feels very appropriate to me, too. Like, if you really want to make a change in your body, a change in your life, um, a month is great. You know, a whole 30, fantastic. But really committing to something for a whole season, that's that's really going to make big shifts. All right. So schizandra, you know, when you learn about schizandra, or when you read a monograph about it, um, you'll see things like it's cooling, um, it supports liver function, especially if there's a lot of inflammation or heat in the liver, um, especially if you're a person who has a lot of agitation. Um, it can drain dampness and stagnant fluids. Yeah, yeah. So um, I often think about schizandra also for um, people who just carry around a lot of anger. And I feel like that's pretty common these days. There's a lot to be... There's a lot to be angry about. Um, and uh, so that that was one of the things that drew me to Schizandra early on. And a couple of years back, I think it was like early in the podcast, like when we were first started doing the podcast a couple of years ago, I decided that I was going to do the whole 100-day thing with Schizandra. Yeah. And uh, what I figured out completely... Uh, like unintentionally, it just was like this amazing uh, side discovery was that schizandra just kills sugar cravings. I mean, just, and the way that we figured this out was that, so I love cake. I am a person who just loves cake. Um, and when I make a cake, it's gluten-free and it's dairy-free and I, it's low carb. I use almond flour and whatever. I sweeten it with honey. It's still cake. Like it's better cake, but it's still cake. And, um... And so if I make a cake, I'm not one of those people who eats like one little piece in a day. I, if, if I make a cake, I'll eat like three pieces in a day and they won't be small. I, I love cake, you guys. Um, and so I had made a cake and I was taking schizandra and the cake molded. Like, I had to throw it away. <laughs> You, yeah, you just didn't eat it. And I, I, I wasn't trying. I had no intention around that. It is just what happened. And I was like, whoa, what does this mean? And uh, so that started a whole um, like rabbit hole of discovery around schizandra and sugar. And um, I started talking a lot about it. I started working with clients this way to see, uh, you know, can we replicate this behavior? What's going on? And you can. Um, yeah, and you're, you know, it does have historical applications for what today we'd call diabetes, mm -hmm. um, you know, or previously would be called sweet blood or blood in the urine, or, or not blood in the urine, sugar in the urine, sugar in the urine. And yeah. things like that. Um, and um, from the kind of traditional medicine perspective, a lot of that relevance is bound up in the sour flavor of the herb, the draining nature of it for eliminating those stagnant fluids. Um, because kind of before people were going around measuring each other's blood sugar levels and <laughs> tracking that kind of thing and understanding what the pancreas was, um, the most obvious signs of like type 2 diabetes was going to be the accumulation of the extra fluid and the weight gain and, and so on. And so this herb that kind of rings you out um, uh, and others like it were always the, the things that would be indicated for that kind of a state. Um, nowadays, of course, we can see that schizandra has a lot of connection there beyond just the sourness of it and, and the effect on fluid balance in the body, though of course that's still relevant, hmm. um, but it also has influences on hormonal coordination. And so this, this like Tulsi, is to be considered an adaptogenic herb, mm -hmm. one that helps us to 
Well, usually we start with the end goal, right? Or the end result, that the adaptogens help us to manage stress more easily and to you know, be able to handle more stress uh, without um, undergoing suffering or damage <laughs> uh, to the same degree. Um, but that's sort of the end of the story, right? Like the way that that is accomplished in the body by the herb often has a lot to do with um, hormonal communications, right? And so that may be through directly supporting an endocrine organ like the pancreas or the liver or, well, really any organ. But <laughs> when we say endocrine organ, we kind of mean specifically the ones whose major job is to make hormones and react to them. Really, every organ, every tissue, every cell in your body is going to make and react to hormones in one way or another. Mm. Okay, but, you know, some are a little more hormony than others. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or we identify that in that way a little bit more than others. Yeah. So, so herbs may have action directly on those organs, um, or uh, they may have constituents that are kind of like those hormones or like those chemical messengers in the body. Um, there's many different ways that it can actually play out. But we can definitely look at schizandra and say that when you work with this over the long time, you see improvements in liver function, you see improvements in hormonal coordination in the body, um, I, what, what I guess we'd call hormonal balance mm -hmm. um, or, you know, elegant homeostasis. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's um, a good one. I like that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, really super helpful on those levels. And those are, are going to be the kind of physiological base level drivers of cravings, mm -hmm. whether it's for sugar or whether it's for um, your allergen, which, yeah, you can often crave your, <laughs> your food intolerance yeah. uh, pretty strongly yeah. um, for lots of reasons. But yeah, so I mean, it's a, it's a very helpful herb for that. Um, and like you say, that, that method of taking 10 of those berries every morning um, and just, just chewing them up and eating them, that is a really great way. I think one reason is because it so completely saturates you with the flavor really does. <laughs> it is an unavoidable flavor. Yeah. <laughs> like, you will be very focused on it. Um, if you're ever having trouble clearing your mind, you just need a minute. Wow, Skizandra can do that because you will absolutely focus. Yeah. yeah. Um, but there are other ways to work with Skizandra. Yeah, it's great as tea. Um, and the flavor is strong, but a little less intense that way. So if the berries just themselves are a little too much for you, um, then definitely trying it as tea is a super great idea. Um, when I make schizandra tea, then I just eat the berries afterwards because mm. um, now they're rehydrated and good. Uh, by the way, Tulsi and schizandra together, they're delicious um, as tea. I Yeah, and you can play with it, right? It doesn't yeah. have to be like a tablespoon of Tulsi and a tablespoon of schizandra. No, still just put your 10 berries in. Like, yeah. that's enough. Yeah. 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 Um, I also really love schizandra in red wine. Uh, so yeah. obviously if you're on a whole 30, you're not maybe going to work with wine, uh, but you can make a tincture of schizandra. You can make it in alcohol. You can make it in vinegar. Um, we do, when we do a whole 30, even though we, alcohol is removed, um, we still work with tinctures and elixirs, um, because what they're, what they're going on there about removing the alcohol is like, first off, a lot of alcohol has a lot of sugar in it. And secondly, if we're going through all this trouble, we might as well you know, like pull out the alcohol too, like just make it a whole, like clean everything. Um, but a couple of droppers full of a tincture for us, we feel like mm, that's not the same as it's negligible. Yeah. Yeah. So if, um, if you prefer it, the flavor wise in a tincture, that's also super effective. Yeah. I wanted to say one thing though. Uh, you mentioned craving your food intolerances, like craving the things that you have sensitivities to. Mm -hmm. And um, that is so common and that might sound like, wait, what? Um, but having like a real addiction um, to like, like being a person who's like, I am totally addicted to toast. Um, that is often, that often goes hand in hand with being a person who also has a very strong sensitivity to. Yeah. And it's often also said sort of tongue in cheek, but that is actually true. Right, 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 right. <laughs> And so um, if that strikes you like, wow, really? Um, that is something that we go into detail on in the... Um, Holistic Nutrition course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, where we also talk a lot about um, how to figure out if you have food sensitivities, why you should even bother to think about food sensitivities. Um, and so, so yeah, that's the Holistic Nutrition course, and you can find it along with all of our courses at commonwealthherbs.com slash learn. Um, 
but you just because of pulling that out and I was like, oh, right. that might sound a little weird. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Because we, shouldn't the wisdom of the body tell me which right. foods that are bad for me and make and me then I never want, want to them. eat them? Yeah. Sometimes that happens, but not always. Not always. Yeah. 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 Sometimes it does happen. You hated milk when you were a kid. Yeah. You know, but not, it does not always happen. Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, so uh, now that we've got our cravings um, at least, you know, muted a little bit with the, <laughs> the Tulsi and the Under Spadangra. control. Under yeah, control. We've got them there. Yeah. Um, let's move on a little bit and talk about some herbs to enhance digestion. Yeah. Uh, because you're changing your diet, right? And so even though you're changing it to the good stuff, right, <laughs> there can still be an adjustment phase. And, um, you know, that can involve a lot of different things. It may be that uh, suddenly your diet contains a lot more vegetables, and that's great for you. But it might also mean that suddenly it contains a lot more fiber. And now your gut flora is undergoing a, a recomposition, mm -hmm. right? Because now you're feeding some kinds of creatures that you haven't really been previously. And you're starving some kind of creatures that you'd previously been overfeeding. Yeah. And this is generally in the positive direction, right? Yeah, generally uh, that's what we want to happen. Right, right. But it's not necessarily comfortable. Yeah, there's during. Gonna be, there's going to be in in your whole thirty at some point, um, unless your diet was pretty close to it already. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to be undergoing some some change in your gut flora composition. There's going to be some gas. There's going to be some bloating, um, and so on. But uh, it's not going to last forever. No, it's like know? remodeling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and herbs can really help with this, right? So the very first herb that we tend to think about in this regard is calamus. Yeah, mm -hmm. I just love calamus so much. Calamus is a bitter, um, and it is a warming bitter, and that is what my body really, really needs. Um, That's what a lot of people need. Yeah, I have a kind of sluggish digestion. On one hand, my body's a tank. Like, I don't, t I don't, I don't tend to get indigestion. I don't tend to get a stomach ache. I don't vomit easily, almost never. Um, but, you know, tanks are like impervious, but slow. Right. And, <laughs> and that's kind of my digestion is <laughs> sort of impervious, but, but slow. And, and um, so having the heat from calamus is sort of like rubbing up the fire, rubbing up the engine and helping things to keep on moving and not kind of get stuck in the lower digestive tract. Mm. Um, so I really appreciate that. Uh, I also love the, um, the sort of nervous system effects that calamus provides moving out of that stress state, the, the sympathetic nervous system and into the parasympathetic, that rest and digest state. So it is assisting with digestion in multiple ways. And I didn't even talk about the bitter part yet. <laughs> right, right. Well, and we could say that this is going to be true about calamus in particular, but also about bitters in general, mm -hmm. that when we, when we consume something bitter, well, well, really when we taste it, when we taste something bitter, uh, that triggers a set of responses inside of the body. Um, it starts with that salivation, starts with production of stomach acid, production of bile from the liver, and release of that through the gallbladder into the intestines, um, and even production of digestive enzymes out of the pancreas. All of these organs are gonna respond when you taste the bitterness on your tongue. That signal, that, that taste is a, is a nerve signal, right, from your tongue to your brain. Um, and then your brain says, all right, everybody, wake up. It's time to eat, it's time to digest. Something's coming in here. And uh, because you've been tasting this bitterness, it could even be dangerous, so we better make sure we really break it down good. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's like a big theory around why does bitter improve digestion? Because mm -hmm. things that are poison tend to also be bitter. And so that's like, if I digest this fast and get it out of me, then uh, if I break it down, then it won't be as dangerous. Right. Um, kind of a theory. Yeah. 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 Um, and so, so yeah, so that's always going to help. Um, and if it's calamus or if it's other herbs, a really great way to work with them is to get them in a, in a tincture. Um, and just take a few drops, you know, 10, 20 drops, uh, half a dropper full or mm. half a squirt, whatever you want to call it, um, right on the tongue, because you got to taste it for it to really work, right? And do that like 10 or 15 minutes before you're going to eat. Um, and it just uh, revs everything up, gets it all ready, and then you introduce food into that environment that is ready to accept it, ready to digest it, and now you're 
actually getting what you ate, right? Because as we say very frequently, you're not what you eat, you're what you digest. Yes. Yeah. And that, that really matters on a Whole30 because you're probably, you know, uh, buying better quality food and that's probably a little more expensive in some ways than what you've been used to. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, if you're going to get the grass-fed steak, you want to actually absorb all that grass-fed goodness out of it. Yeah. Into your, all the way into your muscles, you know? Like, well, and get also, it it's so easy in our current culture to go through a day and basically only eat carbs and dairy. If you're having a really busy day and you're eating some fast food or you're eating on the go, um, that's easy. And carbs, like if it's made out of flour, it's already broken down super small. And that's part of the problem is that it's absorbed very quickly. Um, and, and right. And then that spikes your blood sugar. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so, um, part of this transition is that you're sort of like, um, getting the gears moving again to digest more complex food that maybe like those processes have been sort of like lazy for a while because you've been eating sort of very easy to digest stuff. Um, so having the bitters really just helps you a lot to, um, to get that, those mechanisms going again in a more comfortable way. Yeah. Nice. I'm thinking here, um, our bottle of calamus is really running low. Um, and I had it out on the table because I want to make a new tincture and I want to film it and, uh, put that on the internets. Um, but I, uh, that also made me think that if, if you are somewhere and you don't have access to calamus, like your local health food store doesn't have any calamus tincture. Um, doesn't grow where you live. And, yeah, yeah. You, do, it, you calamus is not the only herb that will do this job. Any of the bitter herbs will. And um, Urban Moonshine is a brand of bitters blend that is pretty widely available. They carry them at Whole Foods. They carry them at um, even a lot of uh, re like not health food oriented grocery stores have them. Um, and so... You know, I, I feel like bitters are becoming trendy again, which is really fantastic. Um, yeah, there was a trend starting a while back in the cocktail scene, too. Yeah. Like, you saw a bunch of bars around Boston, like, suddenly having their own house-made bitters, and it was great. Yeah, really as, exciting. As herbalists, we were super excited. We were like, yeah, I want to try your homemade bitter cocktail. Yes. For sure. Yes. <laughs> it's going to be good. And so, um, so if you can't find calamus, then any of the bitter blends are worth trying. And they're not all the same, so... Um, you know, try a couple, see what you like best, but, um, but yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And if you can't find anything else, get cocktail bitters and just put a little bit in water and drink it that way. Yeah. Yeah. And if you try a few different bitters and you're like, I, uh, then, uh, like, <laughs> How was like that? Get the, blah, blah, blah. Right? <laughs> if you try a few different, let me say individual bitter herbs and that's, that's your reaction every time, then don't despair. Right. There is a long, long tradition in American herbalism of helping bitter herbs to taste a little bit better. And that's usually done in a couple of different ways together. So that you're going to take your bitter herb, you're going to combine it with something that's a bit like pungent or maybe maybe aromatic. So that could be like pungent is going to be ginger. Mm. Um, aromatic is going to be things like the Tulsi we were talking about. Yeah. Um, fennel kind of has elements of both. Um, so things that, that have that kind of like warm spiciness to them can really help here. Um, and then the other secret weapon is citrus. Yeah, orange a, peel in your bitters. Put a bit of orange peel, um, you know, tincture or however it is in with your with your bitter herbs, and suddenly it's just like, hmm, yes, yes, very good. Yeah, very <laughs> good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, excellent. Yeah, and you know, those pungent herbs, those pungents and aromatics, those warming digestives like ginger and fennel and, I mean, even chamomile, um, they, they help with digestion in a kind of a different way from what bitters do. Um, they will increase movement, they will, you know, bring blood to your digestive organs and wake them up and get them alert, but they also tend to relax those organs, to release tension, um, to release constriction that you may be feeling in your guts. And so if you've started eating Whole30 style and you're feeling like, oh, I don't know, I'm getting some gut cramps and I'm, you know, maybe my body's not quite used to this yet, um, some fennel tincture, some ginger, some actually even like ginger, um, uh, like candy ginger, even. Yeah, but it's whole thirty, so. Oh right. You're not gonna do that, right? Okay. Uh, Altoids <laughs> makes 
a ginger. It might still have sugar in it. It still have sugar. Yeah. Well, stick with that ginger tincture, or you know, um, you can get fresh pieces of ginger. You can just slice off a little coin piece of it and chew Uncandied on that. Uncandied ginger. That will be powerful. Yes. Herbal medicine right there. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. Fennel and ginger thoughts. Um, I also think that you know fennel, fennel and ginger are both really important for you. Um, my body is very well adapted to digesting fat um, and digesting like heavier foods, and that th that was not an easy transition for you to make. Right. Um, your body sort of has to struggle to to digest fat, to digest heavy heavy meals. Yeah. And it, just because you're doing a whole thirty doesn't mean that you have to have a heavy meal. Like fish and kale is a totally whole thirty. It's true, but it does sometimes. It does, I'd say, frequently happen when people are thinking about good fats and they're thinking about changing the kind of fats they use, especially in your own home cooking. Mm -hmm. Then it often does involve like a bit of an increase or at least a change, maybe in the in the type of fat you're consuming. Right. So there's still some adjustment phase going on there. And yeah, fennel is really really helpful for that. I mean, like. That's why they put fennel in the sausages, right? Yep. There's a lot of fat in a sausage, and so the fennel helps you digest it. Um, sage is another one that I would really highlight here. Um, sage is, is awesome. It's got pungency to it. It's got aromatics to it. It's got that deep warmth, um, that activation of digestion. It has that relaxant quality to constrictions there. It has a light astringency that can help, too, um, with just like keeping the gut barriers intact. Um, and it really specifically does help with the digestion of fats. Yeah. Um, so that's one, um, if maybe you're like, yeah, I'm doing whole 30. I'm also taking the chance to increase my fat content a bit, or just think differently about how I'm consuming those. Maybe you had just been previously kind of tending toward an extra low fat diet, uh, because you'd absorbed the nutritional wisdom of the eighties, Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, um, that's really one to consider. If it was you're the getting... tr traditional, no, it was the nutritional experiment of the 80s, but uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> turned out not to be wisdom. But, Indeed. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. Um, other digestive herby thoughts there? You know, one other thing here, especially along those lines of, of fat and improving digestion, is vinegar. Um, that if you find that it is challenging to digest protein, Maybe you find that you're eating more protein than you previously did, again, because it is so easy in our culture to, to get through a whole day just on carbs. And that's not, like, there's no judgment statement there. It's just easy. It's easy to do it. And when you're busy, the reality is you do what's easy because, because you're doing too much. So, um, so a lot of times when people start to eat more intentionally, uh, they, like, sort of, go back to like a meat and vegetables kind of a meal, yeah. which is great. But if you have not been doing that, then it can, it can be difficult to process the protein and, and maybe new fats too. So making uh, any kind of herbal infusion in vinegar is going to actually improve your digestive capacity and improve the work that happens higher in the digestive tract, especially in the stomach. Um, so that things are more fully like digested in the stage that they're supposed to be when they leave the stomach. Um, and that is really helpful, really important. Yeah. So any of these herbs we've been talking about, you can, you can infuse in vinegar. Yeah. Yeah. And if you want something, um, really high powered, then you could always, uh, take a bit of fire cider before meals. Yes. So fire cider, um, if this is brand new to you, if you're new to herbalism, then you can just search on that term and you'll get a lot of different recipes, but with a lot of commonalities too, right? So fire cider is pungent herbs infused in vinegar, things like garlic and onions and ginger and turmeric and horseradish and sage as well. And rosemary can go in there mm -hmm. and you can, you can really take this into a lot of, a lot of directions and experiment. Um, but herbs like that tend to be, tend to be the core of what people are putting into their mm -hmm. fire ciders. Um, and so there you're getting that, that, uh, benefit from the, the vinegar, the acidity of it, um, the digestive stimulus that it provides to your stomach, uh, but then also the, the constituents from those herbs. And the so, heat, no, the yeah. heat, the, the bitterness that's coming from the pungent ones, the, um, 
all, all of that is combining to assist in digestion. Nice. Yeah, and you don't need much, right? Um, and again, the same kind of ideas as to the bitters, but maybe even closer to the meal, like right before you eat, you can just take a little, you know, half a shot glass or something of your herb infused vinegar, um, and then go ahead and eat. You may be worried if you have heartburn, um, why would I ever want to consume acid if I've got too much acid in my stomach? Um, with heartburn, in many, many cases, it's actually coming from lowered stomach acid rather than elevated stomach acid. There yeah. are ways to sort that out, it's kind of a longer topic, but uh, again, we have that covered in our digestion course. Uh, so we've got a course on digestive health and we talk about that there, um, about understanding heartburn and, and how to work with that and how it's not always a case of way too much stomach acid. So um, give it a try. You may find that the vinegar actually relieves your experience of heartburn. Um, people with low stomach acid who take vinegar before meals, they may find that they don't get heartburn after that yeah. meal. And Especially if you're a person who gets heartburn after eating. If you mm. get heartburn before you eat and it goes away when you eat, then, then, um, then you're not in that category. But if you're a person who gets the heartburn after you eat, then a little vinegar ahead of time is going to really help. Or you can even just marinate stuff in that fire cider. I mean, that's what barbecue sauce is, you know, like <laughs> vinegar, sugar, some tomato paste. Yeah. Uh, so just skip the sugar. You put the tomato paste if you want to. That's fine. But uh, yeah, just marinate it that way. That's why marinades were invented. You know, like meat is not easy to digest. It's so we stew it, you know, we cook it a long time. We marinate it in things that help us digest it better. And also that help it taste good and, and whatever. So, um, you can do that too. You don't have to just, you know? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. Okay. Um, so let's talk about one more category of herbs that can help while we're going through whole 30. And this is going to be nutritive herbs actually, mm. because Hey, you're thinking about nutrition anyway. Right. right. And right. There, there are herbs that can provide things that it's maybe not super easy to get from kind of standard vegetables and fruits and, and foods and so on. Um, and there are ways that herbs can kind of power up your, your food a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so first I would just uh, come back to that idea about the wild greens, right? So wild greens generally do have bitterness to them. Mm -hmm. And this is a fine way to get bitters into your life if you don't want to take the tincture or sip a, a cup of uh, calamus tea or whatever else um, you could before a meal have a little salad with a bunch of dandelion greens um, or other wild bitter plants yeah. radicchio is not wild but it's one of my favorite bitter it's got like nearly wild intensity level right? yeah it's, yeah it's in there yeah 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 so yeah like some some radicchio some dandelion greens i'm trying to think of ones that you could find in a store parsley is kind of bitter too it's got that, some that would fall into that category yeah 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 so maybe not even just all bitter, but like the, the potency of flavor you get from wild plants and also from things that are considered herbs, like culinary herbs, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I've made a salad sometimes that had like three handfuls of sage leaves in it. And, um, yeah, you, know. you can put sage leaves in a salad. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Um, so what are we getting here? Well, any of the benefits from the particular herbs you use, you know, like parsley is a nice kidney stimulant mm -hmm. and a diuretic and sage is a digestive, like we've been saying, and dandelion greens also support kidney function. And, yeah. um, but also all of these are going to have a decent amount of mineral nutrition to them. Um, generally a lot higher than something like iceberg lettuce, <laughs> yes. um, and other <laughs> domesticated plants. Um, <clears throat> but they're also going to be providing what we call phytonutrients. And this is a really enormous category that kind of covers everything. That's not a like a lettered vitamin <laughs> you know, uh, or like the famous minerals. Right, right, right. right. So phytonutrients is going to include things like chlorophyll, um, which... Yeah, Vitamin green. Which we've heard of, but it has a lot of benefits for blood sugar regulation, for metabolism, for immune function, um, things you may be thinking about anyway that drove you to try your Whole30 experiment. Uh, but then also um, the bitter compounds in plants and the pigments in plants and the antioxidants and all these different kinds of things that they can provide that exist in wild herbs in much greater concentrations than in domesticated plants because those wild plants are under different kinds of stress mm -hmm. and also because they haven't been bred over generations to be sweeter and to be larger, right. which Softer. tends to come at the expense of nutrient density yes. and nutrient complexity. 
Also, a lot of the um, a lot of the think wild plants, especially if you're foraging them yourself, uh, they're growing in better nourished soil um, as opposed to like soil that is just having like mainstream fertilizer added to it and they, they're growing the same crop there every year, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to put in a uh, plug here for things like basil. Um, yes, and basil. cilantro, cilantro, Piles of basil leaf makes a fine salad. As far yes, as I'm concerned. these are yeah. not bitter, but they, um, they are, I mean, they're not wild either. They, they are farmed, um, but they still retain a lot more of their, um, sort of nutritive wild, uh, components than like iceberg lettuce does. Yeah. So, um, how can, how can you tell you can taste it? Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, if, and sometimes you can taste it, sometimes you can see it, right? We're thinking, like, think of, like, the, I don't know, you were at a cafeteria in high school or college, and there's, like, some salad bar, quote-unquote, with, like, a few tomatoes and, like, some chunks of lettuce, and it's kind of, like, I don't know, technically green, but it's pretty pale and washed out, right? You taste yeah. it, and it's, like, crunchy water, okay? You know, <laughs> I heard this was good for me, I don't know why. And there's an enormous difference between that and some like bright green dandelions you bite into and it's got bitterness and that like mineral flavor to it. Or like so, that basil flavor that's just very like so alive. It's bright and uplifting. Yeah. 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 So these things aren't invisible is the point here. That's something that you talk about a lot in the phytochemistry course that um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of chemistry that we can actually detect on the tongue. Um, and that that a lot of these flavor components, um, it isn't that they represent certain um, properties of plants, is that the flavor of that plant, the molecule that has that particular flavor is also the molecule that does a particular thing in the body. Right. And so being able to taste that um, tells you like, oh, this plant has this particular action. I know because we know what that molecule tastes like. Cool. So, yeah, more wild greens. Yes. It's an awesome way to work with herbs and totally counts as herbalism. Yes. Um, and then uh, there is a tea blend we really like to make, which is sort of like wild greens in your teacup. Yes. You know? So we refer to this as nettle and friends. And uh, I have a blog post about it that we will link in the show notes. And actually, we did a whole podcast episode just about nettle and friends. And we even have a mini course, like a little $10 uh, mini course on nettles, anything about nettles. So there's a lot out there that we've said about nettles, but it really is like every wonderful thing about wild greens, all like concentrated into one plant. And you can have straight nettles. That's totally fine. Um, it's a little on the drying side. So if your body is like mine, um, which uh, this is the power of the podcast, so you can't see my body unless you're watching it on YouTube, in which case you can, but I'm wearing like a sweater and a whatever today. So, um, <laughs> but what I mean is if you have a constitution where you carry a little extra water around with you, you're a little, maybe a little on the sluggish side and a little damp, then the drying action of nettles might feel really comfortable and great to you. But if you're a person with a body more like Rin's where, you know, dry and, yeah, you're going to want to adjust it a bit, you know? Um, and so if I'm going to drink nettles for, not, if it's one day, don't worry about it. But if, it, if I'm like, all right, for the next three weeks, for my next whole month, my whole 30 yeah. month, I want to also drink nettles every day, then in my body, I would probably combine like nettles in equal parts with a, an herb that has some moistening aspects to it. So there's lots of different ways to do that, right? It could be, all right, equal parts nettles and marshmallow. Mm -hmm. Simple, I've got a drying herb, I've got a moistening herb, put them next to each other and it's a more balanced formula. Yeah. Or it could be, I really like nettle uh, and I'm going to put a little bit of uh, violet in there, that's moistening, but I'm going to also put a bit of fennel in there and a bit of licorice and a bit linden. of... Linden. And a bit of linden, right? And so um, those all, they're all moistening herbs. Uh, they're not as like strongly mucilaginous and, and moistening powered as the marshmallow is. So maybe I have like one part nettle and one part of each of those other herbs. And so mm -hmm. the, the balance of the formula is more to that, to that hydrating side. Um, that's going to be more sustainable in my body long term. Yeah. So, you know, if you're 
more dry or you retain more water or you're kind of somewhere in the middle, you can adjust the herbs you put together with your nettles uh, to match your body. Yeah. And one thing with nettle is that you do want to let this steep overnight because uh, a big part of the reason that nettles is so amazing is its mineral content but minerals are slow to um to come out into the the solution um and you'll see this yourself like when you you put the nettles and whatever else you're going to put with it into your mason jar put like a good inch in the bottom of the jar at least pour in the boiling water about a quart of water um, or whatever size jar you have. If the jar is smaller than a quart, then don't pour a whole quart into the jar. <laughs> um, they, they probably knew that. They one. probably knew yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Pour in the boiling water. Um, and intend for that to sit overnight. But look at it in about 20 or 30 minutes and observe the color. And then in the morning when you look at it again, observe the color again, it will be a jillion shades darker in the morning. And that is just more of the chlorophyll, more of the minerals, of all the stuff coming out into the water. Now, you don't have to drink it cold. It'll get cold overnight, obviously. You don't have to drink it cold. Um, you can reheat it. That's totally fine. But it's a really actually very easy and very time friendly thing to add into your day. It's just at night, right before you brush your teeth, put the kettle on. Go brush your teeth, do what you gotta do in the bathroom. Um, and then go back to the kitchen. Now the kettle has boiled, pour it over your nettle, just let it sit and go to bed. Okay. You wake up in the morning, you take the jar, you strain it into your water bottle. Um, and if you're anything like me, you just leave the jar next to the sink and go away <laughs> and deal with it later. Um, uh, if you're in, you wash it immediately and compost it immediately because <laughs> you're awesome. Um, but, uh, uh, OCD, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, but it just takes a couple minutes before bed, a couple minutes after, uh, in the morning, and you can take that with you all day long. And actually, you don't even have to be doing a Whole30 for this. Like, even if you had one of those days where all you ate was carbs and it was all fast food, you, just a quart of nettle and, and whatever friends you have paired with it um, through the day is like instant bonus nutrition. It's amazing. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Cool. All right. Um, you know, you could even throw your, your nettle leaf. And, and when we work with nettles, um, we don't really love to do this from tea bags because, like she was describing, yeah. you're going to use a pretty substantial amount of the herb. So we tend to go to a, a wholesale herb supplier or your local herb shop mm -hmm. um, and get yourself a decent amount because, you know, you're going to be using a good solid handful every day. So um, you, can, you can go through quite a bit. It's but, funny. On our shelves, all of the jars are like half gallon size jars and some of them are less but the nettle jar is a gallon jar <laughs> because because yeah, yeah. you just need more nettle than yeah. other things right um but i was going to say like when you have that just like they call it cut and sifted is the form that it comes in it's little you've called it confetti before yes right? it's like herb confetti <laughs> yeah. um but yeah so you can just grab a handful of that and throw that into something like your bone broth because you're doing a whole 30 so you're probably eating bone broth you know yeah um, it's entirely likely yeah or like, you know, plant and veggie and mushroom broth if you're doing the vegan version. Yeah. Um, but uh, throwing nettle into foods is a totally traditional way to work with it. Mm -hmm. um, you could even, depending on what time of the year you're hearing this, you could go and gather some fresh nettles and cook those into a soup. Yes. Or you could saute them and eat them. Um, I really advise this, actually, if you ever do get the chance. Nettle leaves are shockingly delicious and in a, mm. in a way that... Uh, there are a few other things I can think of that taste as good as a fresh nettle leaf right off the plant. Mm -hmm. And you may be saying, doesn't it sting your tongue and your gums and stuff? Yeah, maybe a little bit, but not as much as you think. And it goes away super fast it, in the it mouth. It more like tingles. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, oh, it's so good. But yeah, you can eat them in lots of ways. You could throw some into the broth, and that leads us into other things that you can throw into your broth. Yes. To and, power that up. And this is going to be true whether you make the broth yourself from your very own backyard pasture raised chicken bones that you did all the work for yourself <laughs> or if you got bone broth in a box from the grocery store it is totally fine um you know like box bone broth is way better than no bone broth so do what you got to do but then yeah putting a ton of herbs in there is gonna boost the value so much so toss in the nettle but um 
two of my favorite things. Okay, three of my favorite. Okay, I have so many favorite things to put into the bone broth. Um, but two of them are shiitake and maitake mushrooms. Those are two that are pretty reliably available at grocery stores. Yeah. Um, and putting them in the broth, like really cooking them for a long time, makes them so much more digestible. Like you can saute your mushrooms and they're delicious and that's great, but you won't actually digest them as well as you will if you put them in the broth and let them cook for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so shiitake and maitake mushrooms are, um, they're immune modulators. They're herbs that help your immune system to work more efficiently and more intelligently. Um, so I'm, I'm going out of my way here to avoid saying something like they boost immune activity or they they stimulate immune yeah. activity because that wouldn't be a really fair descriptor of what these do. Um, and also because they are safe for people with autoimmune issues. Right. They are not going to like turn an autoimmune condition and like ramp that up even further. Yeah. Actually, they're very assistive in autoimmune situations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so those medicinal mushrooms, they can, they can really help to kind of give your immune system a tune up, give it some extra reserves, uh, so that it's ready and prepared for the next illness that comes your way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another thing that we really love to put into broth that's kind of similar in that regard is astragalus. Um, astragalus is not a mushroom. It's, uh, it's actually in the legume family. And we would be avoiding legumes on our Whole30, but, but it's the roots. it is the roots. It's the roots, so I think that's different. Yeah, and you're not really going to be consuming your astragalus. You're going to like you're going to cook it up and uh, strain it out when you eat it. But um, but anyway, but why the, would we... the reason that we're avoiding legumes is because of the um, the proteins the, in the... the right the lectins that are in the seed the the actual bean part that you're going to eat. Yeah. And the reason that those are there is because the plant doesn't want you to eat that to because that's it. its reproductive capacity. Yeah. Um, and those lectins are not necessarily present in the roots. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so now there that was like we, a now little. That now that we've cleared yeah. That. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just gotta check if we're still whole thirty compliant. Um, yeah. So I mean, astragalus. It's a. It's another immunomodulator. It's. It's an adaptogen as well. So it's helping with the stress response specifically through that window of immune. Um, immune activity and, and the immune elements of your stress response. Mm. Um, so it really does um, help to build that resilience and also to rebuild after a period of stress or of sickness. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Codonopsis is really and similar. Yeah, in that one of your regards, best friends for a long, long time. Oh my goodness. Codonopsis is one that I turn to um, for recovery when I am just wrung out. Um, it is a long, slow build of energy, of um, like capacity, uh, and so it's not like ginseng where it'll like give you a boost right away. It is, it's, it's a re restoration of what was lost, a restoration of the things that have been depleted that have caused you to become exhausted. Mm. So this is a plant I love because often I, I will work like crazy and then feel depleted and exhausted and then I remember hey I shouldn't really work like that yeah. and then it's time for codonopsis right. and I, I, I uh, over my life this has been a challenge that I am trying to work on and it is getting better every year yeah codonopsis um, is kind of like patient ginseng <laughs> you know yes. like it's like it's, it's moving in the same direction it's it's like supporting the same kinds of of, uh, of quality or a function or energy in the body. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it, it moves you there slowly and at a nice uh, even pace, yeah. which makes it less um, susceptible to abuse. Yeah, <laughs> you know? absolutely. Um, it's very possible to abuse your ginseng and uh, uh, not realize that's what's happening. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And it has a nice flavor. It's very much like parsnip. Um, you can get it dried and uh, put it right in the broth, and it's fine if you eat it. Even you'll, it's enjoyable. It tastes like part. It really, really tastes like parsnip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then wait, there was one more thing that wasn't on our list, but that I really can't not say, and that is seaweeds. Yeah. And um, I noticed that you have planned for us next week's podcast already. Yeah, I wanna I wanna drill in on this because we've been going through these herbs kind of kind of rapidly right here um and i don't feel we've really done them their justice so <laughs> um let's plan next week to do a, a podcast on herbs to supercharge your bone broth 
Yeah, I and, love that idea. And that'll definitely include seaweeds. Yeah, so I'm not <laughs> going to say too much about seaweeds for this very moment, but that definitely put them in your bone broth, and uh, we'll tell you so much more about it next week. You're going to love it. In the bone broth edition of the Holistic Herbalism Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. All right. Well, that'll come up next week. But before we're done for this week, we have shout outs. We do. Uh, I think that I got them all. So, um, so yes, here we go. First to Mary, who is a longtime listener, and her friend Amber, who just gifted her some of our online herb courses for the holidays. Nice. Yeah, I'm Yay. excited. <laughs> yeah. We have a shout out to Alexis at Ocotillo Botanica. Nice who loves the pod and is going to be carrying our book, Herbal Medicine for Beginners, in her shop. Where's that shop? Um, oh, shoot, I didn't write it down. But the shop is called Ocotillo Botanica. And one of the things that I really want to do early this year, like this month, is start a list. See, he's making notes. Uh, is start a listing of herb shops all around the country. Um, so... Hold on, he's actually even looking it up right now. Uh, they're going to be opening soon in Marfa, Texas. Awesome. Yes, so check them out. But yeah, uh, watch on our website very, very soon for information about herb shops all around the country. And if you're listening and you own an herb shop, please email me at info at commonwealthherbs.com and tell me so that I can put you on the list because our students love to be able to shop at local herb shops, and we really want to support that. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Shout out to Jolunket, Jolunket, on <laughs> Instagram. I mean, you never know how to pronounce no. the names. But I we, think it's Joe Lunket. We do our best, and if we get it really wrong, then feel free to send us a, um, a I don't know, audio email. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, but this was... Joe Lunkett, let's go with that, on Instagram, who liked the solstice tea, but was maybe skeptical about the cardamom ratio that Katya included there. You guys, I love cardamom. <laughs> I love cardamom. I want all of the cardamom. Yeah. One little cardamom is not enough. It has to be a lot of cardamom. Yeah. <laughs> I love cardamom, is what I'm trying to tell you. Nicely. Um, okay, and also to Wendy, who is interested in the nervous system and emotional health course, and also the musculoskeletal and alignment course. Um, and both of those are launching this winter, so watch for them in our newsletter. Yes, coming soon to a uh, online course platform near you. That would be <laughs> CommonwealthHerbs.com, I believe. That's the one. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, cool. So then to the Shaw Family Practice on Instagram, who likes the videos we post there, as well as the pod. Well, hey, thank you so much. <laughs> also, while they were singing on Instagram, um, checked their podcast listening stats. I don't know how you do that, but it was really cool because they posted that they had listened to 3,533 minutes of this podcast in 2019. So I thought that was really cool. And, uh, here's to many more minutes in 2020. Yes. Wow. Yeah. That's okay. I'm a, little, <laughs> I'm a little blown away by that one. Okay. Um, uh, Glitter in the Dirt on Instagram uh, made herb-infused wines for the holidays and just reminded us that we didn't send the book plate yet. Oops. But, but if you received a copy of our book for the holidays or if you have one for some other reason and you too would like a fancy inscribed book plate sticker with our signatures on it to put right in there, uh, then shoot us an email and we'll send it to you for real. And I won't drop the ball this time. I promise. Um, our book is Herbal Medicine for Beginners, and you can get it on Amazon or at your local bookshop and also at many local herb shops. Um, <clears throat> so, and if you do, just send us an email. We'll, we'll sign it for you remotely. That's right. Yes. All right. Uh, shout out to Sandy, who listens to the pod in Finland. All right. Yeah. Uh, and, all oh right, and was sharing some personal experiences with the herb Perilla or Perilla. Whenever I see two L's together, I sort of default to Spanish. Well, but... okay. If it's in Scandinavia, it might be Perit. Perit. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, in any case, it's it's a mint family plant. And this she, she mentioned this because um, on one of our earlier podcasts, we had been talking about supposedly poisonous mints, supposedly poisonous plant, plants in the mint family, the Lamiaceae. And Perilla was one that I found and had conflicting info and kind of thought like wait a minute they eat this as food some places it's, it's probably not really toxic yeah and 
San Diego's backing us up on that and yeah. saying that they eat it frequently. Yeah, you can buy it in the grocery store in Finland, apparently, yeah. which is awesome. And San Diego, if you're hearing this and you want to tell us the proper um, Scandinavian pronunciation of that, it would be awesome. <laughs> Yes. All right. Um, Christina in Tennessee, whose parents gifted her funding for herbal courses um, at our online herb school for Christmas, which is awesome. I'm so excited. A nice gift. Yes, yes. yes. Also appropriate for birthdays and various holidays all through the year. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. We have a shout out to Rebecca Jean 26, who left us a review on uh, Apple Podcasts. Thank you. Uh, and that's so fantastic. We really appreciate it. That means a ton to us because it helps other people find the podcast and also because then they see what real humans think about it. Yeah. Right? That's awesome. Yeah. That's great. There, you know, as I was looking at the recommendations that Apple Podcast gives in the alternative health category of podcasts, um, it's sort of there's like a 500 uh, or 600 review uh, threshold to like get yourself into that recommended list. Um, so if you want to help to get our podcast up into that recommended list, um, then run over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. We would really appreciate it. Well, we would appreciate it, but also the people who are better able to find the podcast uh, and spread the herby goodness. Yeah, will they, they don't know it yet, but they, they would appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, one more. Uh, shout out to Naomi in the UK, who's interested in all the different types of tincture making processes and the pros and cons of each one. Right, yeah. I saw that email, yeah. Yeah, that is just one of the things that we cover in the herbal medicine making course. And right now there are 47 close up step by step videos in that course showing how to make all the different kinds of herbal preparations, plus recipes and printable instruction cards and more. Um, plus, whenever we add new videos, um, then they just show up in all the students' accounts automatically. And also, you can ask us questions on anything that you're wondering about, like, hey, I made this and I'm afraid it might mold. Am I doing this right? Or whatever. Um, both in the discussion threads that are attached to every video in the course, but also in our twice weekly, twice weekly live Q&A web conference sessions. Um, so basically you can watch the material on your own schedule. You can watch it a million times as often as you like. You have lifetime access. So you have that flexibility in our courses to do things on your own time, but you also have twice a week direct live interaction. So it's, we're really trying to do the best of both worlds there to, to give all the different options. So um, if you are interested in online herbal courses with Rin and I, then check out all of our courses, including the herbal medicine making course at commonwealthherbs.com slash learn. Oof. All right. Whew. We did it. I, I think that's the I think that's the pod for the day. Yeah. All right. Well, um, good luck on your whole 30. I hope that uh, these herb suggestions help to make that easier, more pleasurable, uh, more delightful and more successful. Um, so we'll be back next week with a discussion about herbs for bone broth. Yeah, that's going to be fun. Yeah. Uh, so until then, you know, drink some tea, take care of yourself, take care of each other. Yes. And uh, we'll be back next time. See you then. Bye.